Hello, in this lecture we're going to continue our discussion of Comparative Advantage, Exchange Rates, and Globalization Chapter 9. Remember that the objectives are to explain the principle of comparative advantage, explain why econo economists and laypeople's views of trade differ, summarize the sources of the U.S. comparative advantage, and discuss some concerns about the future in the U.S. economy. So, we're going to talk now about why uh, economists and laypeople differ on their views of trade. So, most from the economic standpoint we generally think of trade as good so generally there's going to be exceptions of course to that rule but the general rule is trade is good trade usually allows us to consume more than it otherwise would that's going to be the general rule so if that is the case you'll see lots of arguments in terms of of trade being bad like uh, if trade is good why do so many people oppose it so we'll take a look at some of these views of opposing trade when is it opposed there's going to be some grains of truth to it and again there are some areas where trade can be unfair or have problems with it, and we'll talk about some of those as well. But the traditional viewpoint is that trade generally benefits. So the gains of trade, lo trade lower prices are harder to see than the cost lost jobs. So there is going to be a, a piece of creative destruction where jobs are going to be lost through the economy and jobs could be lost to other areas, other countries. And of course, that loss of jobs is hurtful to a lot of people. It's very visible to a lot of people. And the uh, other side of it being the prices, prices being lower, consumers benefiting from lower prices, is not as visible. People don't see the lower prices as readily as they're going to see lost jobs happening. And even if they were comparable, even if you had them on the same level, it's also the case that just human nature tends to see, th we tend to be risk averse, meaning uh, things that are bad, we put more weight to than the positive things. So those things combined may result in us actually seeing the the negative and weighing it more than maybe we should and that's something to consider the public believes that low wages in other countries give them the comparative advantage in everything so we will lose all jobs so it's the case that if we look at other countries obviously we're going to say hey there's a big population there that aren't working they're going to work for lower wages that means that if we open up our borders to other countries then all our jobs are going to be gone and nobody's going to be working anymore and of course, that if the labor was all the same, that would be the case because everybody would have the same level of skills. But at this point in time, that doesn't seem to be the case in a lot of areas because where the skills that we are at are good at at this point in time tend to be higher education skills and, and computer skills and research and entrepreneurial type things. And those things could change over time, but it would take time for those things to change. So at this point in time, the trade gap might be less than we we might see at the first glance when we take a look at the populations in different countries and we take a look at, at opening up trade the, the idea might be thought that that the, tr the jobs will just all be gone and uh, there's going to be influx and, and fluctuations in jobs but it doesn't seem that it, at the first point in time that there's going to be a decrease and if there's differences in skill levels then you would think that we would actually benefit from trade because we would have that, that skill level difference and people would focus on what they're good at and therefore uh, we could benefit actually from lower prices in some cases. We'll take a look at, at some problems too in a second. Lay people often think uh, of trade as only in the manufacturing goods. So when we think about trade, we usually think about things, things that we trade. So if we think about things that get traded, we probably are seeing a lot more things coming in than... <laughs> we are producing and sending out, such as things coming in from uh, China. And that's, that's true in terms of things, but we are exporting a lot of other types of things, meaning we are exporting intangible goods. We're, we're doing a lot of research and development. We have the technology, technology pharmacy type goods, making drugs and, and these types of things to, to be patented. And those are types of things that, that we're currently very good at at this point in time that we, we are exporting as well. So it's the imbalance is probably not as big as we might think if we're just thinking about the things that we are producing. Now, again, it is important to think about the things that we produce because we, we do not want to be completely dependent about on things from other countries. If we had a war or something like that, we would want to have manufacturing plants here and not be completely dependent on resources for stuff as well. But from an economic standpoint, the trade difference may not be as big as we we would think if we were thinking about the whole spectrum of goods and services and not just goods. So sources of U.S. comparative advantage. 
So U.S. physical and technological infrastructure is the best in the world. So when we think about the ability to produce things, we're going to have to think about trade, think about communication, think about uh, technology. These are types of things that are pretty good in the U.S., really good compared to most of the rest, pretty all the rest of the world. So that gives the U.S. firms a pretty big advantage in that area at this point in time. Again, could change in the long run, but at this point, it would take some time for something like that to change, the infrastructure to change. Wealth from past production and borrowing allows the U.S. to be the world's largest consumer. So that, of course, gives us a lot of control, being one of the largest consumers because of our financial position at this point in time. And, of course, if anybody wants to produce something, they have to consider the U.S. market in that, which influences the types of production and, and, the, and the trade that will happen. U.S. companies and individuals hold a large number of intellectual property rights. So that's the thing that we tend to be good at. So we tend to be good at services at this point. We tend to be good at education. We tend to be good at basically making things like computers and making things like programs and doing things like pharmacy research and development and patenting movies and those types of things. That Those are where we have the intellectual property and are doing well in. Some concerns about the future, however. Uh, inherent and transferable comparative advantage. We have the inherent comparative advantage are based on factors that are relatively unchangeable, such as resources and climate. So those are the things that we're good at just because kind of the nature around us. So if we happen to be full of oil, then of course, obviously we have a comparative advantage on the oil. If we have good climate, we have a comparative advantage there. If we have good farming resources, we have a comparative advantage there. Those types of things aren't going to change too rapidly. Obviously, if we drill all the oil, then <laughs> we won't have any more. But you can see that those things don't change except for basically changes in nature. And things like weather aren't going to change uh, too readily. So those things aren't going to go away too easily. Transferable comparative advantage, however, are based on factors that can change relatively easily, such as capital, technology, types of labor. And notice those are the things that we're currently good at because we have, we've kind of got to jump on those types of things in terms of education, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of technology. These are the things that we type to, that we tend to excel at. The idea here being that whether a country can maintain a higher standard of living in the long run depends in part on whether its comparative advantage is inherent or transferable. So taking that to the next step, we're going to say the law of one price means that in a comparative market, there will be pressure for equal factors to be priced equally. So in factors of prices that are equal, firms can reduce costs by reducing production in countries with lower factors of production. So if we, and the idea here being that it's the convergence hypothesis is the tendency of economy forces to eliminate transferable comparative advantage. So remember that transferable advantage, those things like technology, those things like education and infrastructure, over the long run, you would think that they, those would go away as other countries catch up. So if other countries basically catch up, then that comparative advantage, would you would think, lessen over time. And once that happens, you would have this idea of the, of the one price in those types of areas being that if there's a gap, of course, then the market would, would eliminate the gap that is related to uh, the, con the comparative advantage that are transferable. So the idea would be that that transferable gap would go away. Now, we wouldn't know if it's going to go away by uh, the lesser countries uh, going, you know, rising up in, in terms of price levels or with us price levels right going down in terms of wages and whatnot. Probably would be somewhere in the middle, some of both happening. We don't know how long it would happen for basically the idea of infrastructure, technology, education, all these things to improve. It could take a long time. It could happen faster than we would think. But you would think all else equal that these are the types of things that uh, people could get better at and countries could get better at. And if they did, then the, uh, the transferable comparative advantage would then lessen.